and welcome to State View. I'm Mark Crosby. Thank you for joining us uh, for this particular program. Uh, State View is a program that really gives you insight uh, and helps you to stay informed with legislation happening on Beacon Hill. Well, Senator John Keenan from the Norfolk and Plymouth District has joined us today. And uh, Senator, welcome back. Great, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you, uh, a new legislative session, a new leadership on Beacon Hill. We have, of course, uh, Governor Mara Healy and Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, uh, both of them come with a, a lot of different experiences. Obviously, the governor comes from the attorney general's office, and I had the opportunity to work with her and her office quite closely over the years, primarily on opioid matters, and she was great. And then uh, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll comes from Salem and the mayor's position there, so she has a great background in local government. So I think it's a, a really good team. There's exciting things going on, and they're putting together their administration now, and they're hiring very capable, competent people. So I, I think the Commonwealth is in good hands. Very good. That's good to hear, being a resident, of course, of the Commonwealth. Uh, let's talk about um, kind of this point in time. We are recording this on February 15th, 16th, 17th, 17th, I believe. Uh, my dates are, let me, let me check my phone, 17th. And uh, I guess I'm saying this in regard to the new legislative session and what happens, what has happened. And uh, obviously bills were, uh, you were accepting uh, information for bills to be refiled. Talk sure. about the process, rules. Uh, sure. So we get sworn in in early January, and then the first task after that is to make sure that we get our bills filed. And I don't know what the count is exactly this year, but there's over 6,000 bills that are filed in total between uh, the House and the Senate. And every one of those is entitled to a hearing throughout the legislative process. So there's bill filing deadline, and then we move forward into the rules debate, where we debate what rules will govern the Senate and the House and Senate when we meet jointly for the uh, next two years. That occurred last week, and that's now done, um, except for the joint rules. They work out differences between the House version and the Senate version. So those differences will be worked out. Committee assignments have been made, and now we're in the process of having bills assigned to committees, and then the hearing process on, uh, for each one of the bills will begin. So what does committee assignments look like for you? So committee assignments, uh, I was named chair of the Elections Committee which is a very interesting and exciting committee given the times. Uh, there's a lot of debate about how our elections should be run, about how um, people should be allowed to participate in those elections, whether it be by mail, uh, ballot drop mailboxes where you can drop your ballot, whether it's early voting, day of voting, all those types of things uh, have been addressed to some degree and will continue to be addressed as we, as we move through this legislative session. There's still some work to be done in terms of fine-tuning that process and making sure that everybody who wants to vote has the opportunity to vote. So I'm excited about that. I will continue to serve on the Transportation Committee, which is really critical for Quincy because we have such uh, great transportation needs here in, in our city. I will also continue to serve on the Housing Committee. I'll serve as the Vice Chair of the Housing Committee and then on Mental Health and Substance Use, which I have been on for many years, which is one of my, my favorite topic areas, and then also I'll continue to serve on the Ways and Means Committee. So it's going to be a busy session. Let's talk about, uh, you mentioned transportation, and uh, that brings me to the MBTA, and uh, what um, recent happenings, I suppose, going on there. Uh, I believe um, there has been a proposal for the commuter rail and ferry to be removed. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion about who should be responsible for safety oversight of the T, and presently it's under the Department of Public Utilities. And so in that course of that conversation, trying to say whether the next entity, if there's to be a new entity to oversee safety of the T, whether it should just be responsible for the MBTA subway system and buses. Um, Keolis is kind of a, a unique situation. They fall under federal oversight to a large degree. So there really is a question of, should there be a separate entity, and should their area of oversight be limited strictly to uh, subway and uh, to buses? Other options might include overseeing water transportation, because the MBTA does run some ferries, and also what do we do with uh, transportation network companies like uh, Uber and Lyft? Should they be under the Department of Public Utilities, or should they come under a new entity as well? So that's uh, to be determined. I support 
a separate entity as open and free as possible, um, you know, independent as possible to oversee the MBTA in particular and uh, buses. I think that's uh, a wide enough focus for whatever new entity, but we'll see how it all shakes out. But um, something, has to, something has to change. And when you talk about safety, safety with the equipment and I suppose safety at the stations because both have been a concern. All of that. We've had the escalator incident in the back bay. We had the tragic, tragic accident where a gentleman was killed on the red line uh, while coming off a train onto a platform. We have safety issues about trains, uh, braking systems failing while they're supposedly parked. On the green line, we've had some issues with the ability of trains to slow down or come to a stop in a timely way and not being able to do that, being involved in accidents. So it's, it's all of that. And um, you know, we also have to change the culture of safety at the MBTA. They have an anonymous tip line for employees to call when they see something that is wrong from a safety perspective. And my view is, if you have to report a safety issue anonymously, it means the culture is wrong. You should be able to say, there's a safety issue right here, raise your hand, it should be checked out, and you should be thanked for picking up on that potential safety issue, as opposed to being told, call an anonymous tip line. So there's a lot of changes that are necessary. The people who work there work really hard, they do good things, but we've got to get um, you know, all of those things in order, platform safety, signal safety, workforce safety, all of those things have to be uh, really looked at, and there has to be an assurance to the public and to the employees that they are safe. And here in the city of Quincy, the bus facility on Bergen Parkway, that was delayed, correct? <clears throat> yes, that went out to contract and the bid numbers came in very high. And that's not unique necessarily to that facility. It's happening everywhere because of supply chain issues, because of labor issues, because of uh, materials cost. So it, um, it is uh, in the process of being redesigned. They're pretty near complete with that. It's going to be a shorter building. Some of the um, way that they would charge buses in there, electrically charged buses, has been modified. And so it's now at the point where they anticipate it being about a year behind uh, in terms of being completed. So we are, uh, we'll be meeting with them very shortly to get a, an update on that and to push them to move it along as quickly as possible. You had mentioned uh, the opioid crisis and continuing to work on that crisis, still a crisis. It sure is. Uh, people are still dying. We were making progress before COVID. We had actually kind of bent the curve in terms of overdose deaths. And with COVID and people being separated from the services and programs, we saw those overdose overdoses and overdose deaths increase. And so um, we are getting those programs back up and running as best we can. And the emergence of fentanyl has also changed the dynamic dramatically. And um, you should mention that CVS, where I live, the pharmacy was just robbed about a week ago. It's uh, the demand for it, fentanyl is is, is great. Uh, unfortunately, and it's a very potent drug. And we're finding fentanyl being mixed with cocaine and other drugs. It's being pressed into pill form, which is very dangerous because people take the pills not knowing that it's fentanyl. And there are a couple of drugs out there that are starting to uh, elevate as well. And that is methamphetamine. We're trying to stay ahead of that. I had sponsored legislation which passed, which created a methamphetamine commission. That commission has done its work and has made some recommendations to try to ward off that becoming a bigger problem than what it now is. And then there's some other synthetic drugs out there that uh, animal tranquilizers, uh, drugs like that, that are making their way into fentanyl pressed pills and into the fentanyl product supply. So when people use them, they not only uh, are experiencing what comes with fentanyl, but then this tranquilizer kicks in and many of them are passing out for an extended period of time and they're at a great risk of death and if they managed to come through. Um, there seems to be rashes that are developing as a result of it. It's sometimes so severe that there's been the need for amputations. So dangerous, dangerous things out there in the streets. I think there was uh, a news story regarding tranquilizers in Springfield. Yes, um, it's here. It's, it's here in Massachusetts. New Hampshire is monitoring it very closely. They have seen a, a spike in it. Uh, really dangerous situation and any person who thinks from a recreational standpoint, oh, they'll try a drug, whether it's cocaine or something else, you just have no idea what you're trying. So the advice would be don't. Um, it's just it's a really dangerous time. Let's turn now to the bill revenge porn. 
and explain that for <coughs> folks that might not quite know. Sure. So I was contacted by uh, people who live in my district about situations where, in some cases, they may have consented to a photograph being taken of them in, you know, in any situation. And then, unknown to them, they found that those photographs or videos were shared on the Internet. And it is absolutely positively devastating to people. It is a crime in Massachusetts to t take a picture of somebody or to film somebody without consent. But if somebody consents to that, Massachusetts is one of just a couple states where it's not illegal for somebody then to post it. So somebody who's in a relationship, they might take a video of each other with consent, and then there may be a breakup, and one or the other may post that video online without the other's knowledge or consent. And in Massachusetts, that's not a crime. So the revenge porn bill would look to criminalize that behavior. Recognizing that a lot of young people are the ones who uh, are uh, victims of this, um, it sets up a diversion program for young people who might be engaged. And it also establishes a curriculum to make young people aware of what's going on relative to social media and these types of activities. But there's really been some heartbreaking stories in each of the towns in my district where this has happened and people's lives uh, severely impacted, in many cases ruined. And it's very, very emotional for people who have to deal with it. Um, not only is it the breach of trust in a relationship, but then it's the knowledge that these pictures may be out there for the whole world to see. And what uh, happened with it during the last legislative session? It passed the House of Representatives uh, relatively early in the legislative session compared to the Senate. We were able to get it passed in the Senate, and then we ran out of time uh, for purposes of reconciling the differences between the two bills. But Rep. Jeffrey Roy uh, was the House sponsor and the Senate sponsor of the bill. We're in regular contact on it. Um, if it had been left just to the two of us, I think we needed about 15 minutes to resolve it and move it forward. But um, at the end of the legislative session, it was a mad dash on a lot of different things. Let's talk about um, an act. You are the co-sponsor of an act related to universal school meals. Yes, during COVID, we provided students with free meals. And um, regardless of whether they met certain income guidelines, because in a lot of communities, they found that all the paperwork involved, gathering all the paperwork from parents, income information, it was taking a lot of time and effort and resources to do that. And some had done an analysis and found that it's just faster and, and less expensive to just provide the meals. So that's from an economic standpoint and from an a administrative standpoint. From a good health of the child standpoint, um, obviously a, having a good lunch, a good breakfast is critical to the educational process. And so uh, the governor extended that program for, Governor Baker did before he left office, he extended that program for a year of, of free lunches and this legislation would make it permanent. It's not all that expensive in the grand scheme compared to what school districts were spending otherwise. Um, it ensures that everybody has access to a good, healthy meal, and we know that the, the benefits of that show up in the classroom throughout the course of the day, and then long-term in a, a, a child's educational development. Absolutely. I often, if I don't have lunch before, say, an interview like this, I don't, my brain doesn't think, mm -hmm. As, now, you could argue it's age, but it doesn't think I'm as at well. that age, too. So. <laughs> but clearly, having a good meal fuels the brain. Absolutely. So I, I, uh, Senator D. Domenico has been the sponsor that I'm happy to co-sponsor it. We were down in Braintree not that long ago um, on a little bit of a press re, uh, event relative to it. So I'm excited about it, and we're going to push real hard. Staying with schools and education, let's talk about uh, teachers' strikes here in Massachusetts, they are illegal. They are illegal. It's illegal for certain public employees to strike, including police, fire, and teachers. And that's been a pretty long-standing uh, law, rule, practice here in the Commonwealth. In the last few months, we have seen, uh, in a couple of municipalities, teachers' unions strike uh, in violation of state law. And they understand that it's in violation of state law, but they are frustrated feeling that they haven't gotten the recognition they deserve or the wage increases that they deserve or changes in the work environment and they feel that their ability to best teach children has been impacted. Um, so a couple have gone on strike. There's legislation that would allow teachers to strike if after a certain period of negotiations they haven't come to an agreement with the municipality. Uh, we're in the process of reviewing that legislation. I haven't taken a position on it yet. There are a lot of factors involved. Should teachers have that right but not police or fire? 
and if teachers get that right and then police get it and fire get it, then you know, where are we in terms of three really important areas in a community, education and public safety, uh, both police and fire, so those three departments. So it's something that um, you know, we'll take a look at. I just hope and I wish that it wasn't necessary, but um, when I worked in the mayor's office in Quincy, we had negotiations with teachers and you, it's always a back and forth and never easy. So I'm hopeful that the city and the uh, Quincy teachers will come to an agreement and that ultimately this type of legislation allowing for a strike won't be necessary. We have to value our teachers. Um, they do phenomenal work. They were really challenged during COVID. And we found during COVID that when students aren't in class, there's a pretty direct immediate impact on their educational attainment, achievement, uh, that it really impacts their learning. And so that's another argument that if teachers are allowed to go on strike and it becomes a week or two weeks or three weeks, um, beyond what that does at a home where uh, parents are trying to figure out what to do with their children, and even teachers who have children, them trying to figure it out, um, there's also that loss of learning opportunity that we find is um, pretty, pretty seriously detrimental to, the, to children. Now, there have been fines imposed on those that have gone, on the unions that have gone on strike. Yes, there's been daily fines. I can't remember how much they were. And then I know it's up in Woburn, and I don't know if they've resolved it yet, but they're still trying to figure out how to pay for kind of the um, consequential cost of the teachers being out on strike. And so that's still, I think, being worked out. So there's, there's a lot to it. And it will probably take up um, a good amount of time just this alone. Yes. This topic alone. This topic alone, absolutely. But, um, you know, teachers uh, play an incredibly important role in, uh, in our communities, and we have to recognize that, and it's, it's expensive to live in the communities where they teach, and we have to make sure that they can live in those communities or near those uh, where they teach, and um, recognize that it's a job that we have to value. Let's turn now to two of your districts, Abington and Quincy, and talk about the Complete Streets Program. Yeah, so the Complete Streets Program is funded through the legislature, and it allows for certain projects to be done upon kind of a grant to a grant process. So in Quincy, for instance, there's the um, intersection of Granite Street and Whitwell Street that will undergo a redesign and reconstruction to address some of the shortcomings of that intersection. And there'll be similar work going on down in Abington, and we try to promote it in uh, communities throughout our district uh, because it's a way to address a lot of things. It's not just pave a street. It's let's look at the sidewalks, let's look at the street, let's look at bike lanes, let's look at uh, traffic islands and crossing signals. It's configuration. It's configuration. So it's a, it's a, a complete approach to an intersection or a street. And uh, communities like it, it allows them to do more comprehensive work. And um, so we'll continue to do it. Quincy has been uh, very good at, at applying for these funds um, and, and successful in getting them, as have um, most of the communities, if not all the communities in my district. I believe $1 million, that's the price tag for Quincy and Abington. Yeah, between the two of them, yes. Um, so it, it's, it's, um, it's a great program. How about, uh, let's look at an intersection here in Quincy that has gotten some uh, coverage recently because of a lease that is looking to um, be extended. And that's Quarry Hill Drive. And I'm not sure of the, um, the street that actually cuts that, but you could probably tell me. Yeah, so it's, it's Willow Street. It's the ramp coming off of Route 3 South. It's Rashuti Drive that leads up to uh, Quarry Hills, which might now be Quarry Hill Drive. Actually, I think you may be right. So it's that intersection at the bottom. Anybody that's gone up to an event at Granite Links or lives up in that area or gone up to the ball fields, know that it, as you come under the expressway and make your way up to that intersection, trying to get across that intersection is very difficult. Um, it was anticipated when the ramp was built back t about 20 years ago, 20-something years ago now, that this would be a problem with increased traffic, and it is now. That intersection is rated as one of the top 5% uh, traffic crash intersections in the Commonwealth. So there's a price tag of about a million and a half dollars to repair that intersection. And uh, I have to say that uh, Representative Bruce Ayers has been on this uh, right from the start. He's done a phenomenal job of uh, working with the city and coordinating with the state to see if we can address this. Um, I have, uh, following his lead, we've met with the traffic engineers, TPEL department, with the city solicitor, just to make sure that one, that intersection can be addressed in the short term, and then once it's signalized, 
um, that we have some funding available anticipating what might happen in the next 20 years so that if there needs to be another traffic audit that there's funding available to do that that you don't have to wait for it to get worse that you can monitor it continually so representative Ayers has done a great job on that and it's a dangerous intersection uh, you feel like you're taking your life in your hands every time you you try to get up the hill you were telling me of a person that you know that actually goes way out of their way to avoid that intersection. Yes, yeah, somebody was telling me that they go down through uh, basically Lake and Square, get on the expressway, and then get off the expressway ramp. I remember when they built that ramp, it was about six weeks, six weeks, which was a record. And I remember being there at like 2.30 in the morning when they did the initial blasting of the granite uh, in order to free up uh, space to run that ramp off of the highway. And, uh, and again, that was 20-something years ago, and it was anticipated by the traffic engineer, Jack Gillen, back then, that we would reach this situation. And Quincy has, has done some really good design work on it. So uh, Quincy's traffic engineer and TPL department have really gotten out in front of this. Let's talk about sports betting. And it has been legalized for about yes. now, maybe about two weeks? Just about that, yes. Yeah, so let's talk about, um, there have been some bumps along the way, but they have been bumps that have been acknowledged by the three Massachusetts casinos. Yes, they took bets on in-state college sports, which they're not supposed to, and I think they, it occurred on the first weekend. And so there was three facilities that did that. I believe it was on Harvard basketball, um, which I thought was interesting of all kind of things for there to be a betting interest in, um, but that did occur. And, you know, we're going to have these experiences as the industry grows. My concern remains the promotional and advertising techniques of these um, sports betting companies. You turn on a sports game now at timeouts, they'll go back to the studio and they'll say, okay, I'm coming out of the timeout, who's gonna be the first team to, to score, score points? Get your bets in now. Um, after a game, when they're talking not only about the performance of the athletes, they'll be talking about how the team did against the spread. So I, I'm really worried about where all this leads, but mostly I'm worried about young people being targeted with this. And so we have filed legislation that would make it basically an unfair deceptive practice uh, for advertising techniques that seem to target not only just young people, but anybody um, with these ideas of um, promotional promotions that you get free money to bet, that you can do this certain parlay and not ru uh, lose money, that you can get certain credits for this. And they're nothing but efforts to lure people into it. They're hooks. They're hooks to get people in. And my understanding is that when people set up the accounts and don't bet everything that they may have set up an account with, that sometimes that it's difficult to get money back. Um, so it just really has to be watched closely. So the legislation I've filed would uh, make sure that they're not unfairly or deceptively targeting people with their advertisements. And if you ask me personally, this is my opinion right now, I, I think they are. It reminds me of other legislation that you were involved in, and that was the flavored tobacco, again, dealing with how something is advertised. The same thing. And so we've done it on flavored tobacco. Um, we worked really hard to get advertising protections in place for cannabis. And then when sports betting came along, we attempted at a minimum to get the same standards in place that were in place for cannabis. And we were unsuccessful. So cannabis, which I think is got some interesting advertising out there as well. They're subject to some guidelines, and um, the legislature was unwilling to put those same guidelines or restrictions on sports betting. And I thought we, they should both be treated in a similar way when it comes to targeting young people. But we're going to keep working on it, uh, because we know that their future profits are tied to getting young people hooked to cannabis, uh, to, gambling, to gambling, to tobacco, all those types of things. I thought uh, we would end the program with something called Around the District. So it's you out and about uh, throughout your district. And we will start actually in Quincy. We do have some photographs. You visited uh, Wollaston, the Wollaston section of Quincy, for a 100th anniversary. Yes, a 100th anniversary of the Wollaston branch of the Thomas Crane Library. And the scary thought of that is I am now 59 years old. And the library is only a little bit older than I am in that context. Um, and I remember going there as, as a kid. I'm 49, whatever it comes out to be. You know, you know, How do you do your math? Yeah, 41, <laughs> 41 years. I think you're uh, okay. Yeah. But um, it just it, it amazed me how time quick goes by so quickly. I spent a lot of time in that library as, as, a, uh, as a kid. And so it was great to, to be back in there and to see it. Not much has changed. It still has that warm, welcoming feel to it. So it was exciting to be there. 
I have a pencil and I brought this pencil on set because of the photo that you had taken at the Wollaston Branch Thomas Crane Public Library. Because look at that, do, do kids know what this is? I don't know if they know that that's a pencil sharpener. And I think what's really interesting about that picture too is so you have this pencil sharpener, which is, I remember as a kid, you probably remember. And um, when I went to the Wollaston Library, you know, Wollaston Center was, was a different place. Um, and right next to this pencil shop, which kind of represents old walls and center, you'll notice that there um, uh, are books that have Chinese characters on them, and that reflects the great change that's, that has occurred in the neighborhood. So as, it's a nice transitional photo, I think, from you know way, way some things were to where they are now, and that there's not a whole lot of difference when you really think about it. It's just people want a community library. Interesting. That's the artist's eye. Let's talk about Rockland and the Phelps Elementary School. Yeah, so School Building Authority, we worked with them and obviously the, the, the elected folks down in, in Rockland and um, a committee that they set up, a community committee, committee to um, move the Phelps Elementary School through the SBA process. They had the ribbon cutting a short while ago and it was just great to be there. It was an exciting night. Mr. Phelps was there. Students with parents were there. Um, Rockland has made such a commitment to education through their facilities and their teachers and programming. It's, it's a great community, and to be part of that ribbon cutting was, was really nice. Very nice. Abington, you visited uh, the seniors in Abington, and I believe you had uh, Home Depot uh, containers. Yes, yeah, so we were able to access some containers, and we delivered them to all the towns in the district. And within those containers uh, were coats and uh, gloves and things like that to help people get through the winter, specifically targeted to veterans. Uh, but we brought them and we were able to bring them to the community centers as, as well. Um, the community centers do such great work, the senior centers. And in Abington, um, they do a nice job down there. And I have a, a good friend who I met down there over the years named Adele, who um, I was lucky enough to go to her 100th birthday at the Abington Senior Center. Adele's in a nursing home now, and I visited her just recently, and she's still as sharp as ever and anxious to get home. But those type of relationships and that you you build in the um, senior centers and the it's just really nice Absolutely. to go there. We do a lot of programming with the Kennedy Center here yes. in Quincy. Oh, they do a phenomenal job. I was down there for Valentine's Day. Lastly, we're going to look at uh, a new town in your district and the Hanover Hawks Patriot League champion women's soccer team. Yes, yeah, great to have them to, to, to the State House. Um, great group of, of students. They obviously had a very successful year, so it was nice to be able to recognize them at the State House. And Hanover is new to the district. We've been down there quite a bit. We had office hours last week there and ran into a couple of folks who gave us a phenomenal history of the town of Hanover. Then interestingly, um, the woman who gave me that history, she was talking about her father and what he did for a living. And he worked for a newspaper. And I said, what newspaper? And she said, The Wrecking American. And I said, my father and my uncles all worked at The Wrecking American and they were contemporaries of each other. So it's a small world. And they were also to have, able to have a great meeting with um, the town officials in Abington, the heads of the various departments, and I, I mean, I'm sorry, in Hanover, and they do, uh, they really do a good, good work down there. Very young police chief and fire chief, they're doing great work. I think we have that photo up on screen as we speak. Yeah, so we met with the police chief, the fire chief, public works, we talked about water, we talked about um, their uh, sidewalks, we talked about road conditions, uh, dam um, road work that needs to be done right out uh, in Hanover Center, right outside town hall. We talked about libraries, you name it, we covered it. It was a great meeting and we're in regular contact with the folks down there and uh, it's been a great addition to the district and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Well, I wanna thank you for joining me here today and certainly another full half hour program, thanks to yeah. you. Thank you, thanks. And we'll welcome you back uh, in short to order and uh, continue kind of where we left off. Great, thank you. And thank you at home for watching. You have been watching the program of Quincy Access Television Please continue to support the local access TV station where you reside.